So what I want to say is to you, um, aloha kakaimia. Why do I say that? Um, actually, I spent one year in my life in Maui, and I got introduced to a principle by the shamans that they apply in their philosophy, which is kiaola. It means also medicine. Kiaola means doing the right thing to the right time, to, with the right intention to the right person, um, with the right tools uh, the first time. So basically, personalized medicine is as old as medicine is, and everybody who's been to surgery or whatever kind of uh, physical examination knows how personal medicine is. Um, so I think the new uh, terminology, precision medicine, which is arising in the centers and think tanks, particularly in the US, is more appropriate. And actually, I got first introduced to this um, terminology by a lecture by Clayton Christensen, who's famous for disruptive innovation. We heard about that yesterday. He's a critic of how we perform medicine and how we wasteful, um, wastefully use the resources. And later on, the NRC in the US actually felt we would need a new terminology because personalized medicine somewhat is misleading, giving the impression that every patient gets his own patient-specific uh, tailored drug, which is obviously in the chronic diseases which uh, cause the most socioeconomic burden not possible. And meanwhile, we see a trend. The, U the UK will adopt this uh, terminology in August this year. It's slowly coming to Europe, and the World Economic Forum uh, has adopted it last year as well. So. Just as an introduction, I do not like personalized medicine. I think the better and more appropriate uh, terminology for the goals that we need to achieve is precision medicine. So what is precision medicine? Yesterday, this is adopted, by the way, from Clayton Christensen. Um, yesterday's medicine was very intuitive. Like we had few symptoms where the MD had to evaluate in a specific context whether the fever is, could be caused by some kind of a bug or it might be caused by a virus or whatever else infection. Um, now later on we had this kind of large studies, evidence-based medicine where we, from my viewpoint, compare very often in chronic diseases, apples with oranges, and are very much surprised at the end that we get a fuzzy picture and it's not really clear which drug works for which patient. And the new paradigm perpetrated by Clayton Christensen is uh, algorithm-based. It's basically big data, number crunching, becoming more precise, more analytics introducing as a support system to the MD, uh, as a decision um, support system. And obviously what we will need is what we call personal molecular fingerprints. I will elaborate on that in more detail later on. And it's integrating also non-molecular content, waveforms, imaging technologies. All this will be fed into some kind of number crunching devices. You will eventually need reference databases as the key value driver in the future anyways. It's like this Amazon business. They know you, they know what you want to buy. It's a Facebook business. Reference databases will be become a key enabler and value driver in the new paradigm precision medicine in general. And all this will be come to the patient also in, in emerging markets via mobile ICT technologies. We heard about five, uh, 5G, which will be instrumental as well as in-memory technologies. And eventually, you will end up with having this kind of paradigm, exactly the right thing for the right patient and so on, at the right time, 24-7, everywhere in the world. It's a nice vision. So, um, who are the leaders? and adopt early adopters. Um, very ambitiously, in 2011, Pfizer proposed in 2020, five out of every drugs would be launched with a precision medicine uh, component, meaning being developed by this new paradigm, which implicates several dramatic shifts in how we perform clinical studies, how we actually um, identify the right patient for the right drug. Um, others are Google with Calico. Nobody really knows what they are doing, but they have a tremendous amount of money, which is just a billion, but basically it's unclear. The team is like coming and going. People's changed positions. 
we hear about 23andMe, their business model is very trivial. They made the test for, um, for some kind of predictive genomics, whatever they call it, so cheap, just because they're interested in the data. They're not interested in providing the customer with content. They wanted to have the data because that's what they can eventually use in the future to create further businesses and sell these kind of data because the, when you ever uh, applied for this test, you fill out the form which is very informative about your lifestyle, what you do, how much you exercise, your relatives, etc. So these are very valuable t uh, data that Google intends to sell, to sell to insurance companies and whatever. Um, recently, human longevity came on the radar screen. It's a new startup which eventually got a seed funding of $70 million. Although, I mean, it's Craig Venter. He teamed up with Metabolon, and his goal is to sequence 45,000 people and compare their metabolomics. He's tackling, obviously, aging as Calico does. Molecular Health is a local player, which is trying to penetrate the US market currently. They are heavily backed by HOP and SAP. And one of the best models for creative um, shaping new business model is basically foundation medicine because they standardized the procedures for genomics testing, developed several kits, and again, their value driver is the databases that they generate. They did an IPO of 100 million within four years after their initiation. So, big is beautiful, right? So, uh, I highlighted terabyte because terabyte, that's what we generate already with genomic sequencing these days when we uh, just analyze one patient with all these omics technologies. Facebook, for example, creates 500 terabytes a day. Um, so it, it's a lot of zeros. And there are some people that can talk a bit more about what big data is and etc. I'm just DMD to give you an impression uh, in which kind of dimensions we go and what we as MDs or entrepreneurs that engage in this new field are going to face because dealing with this kind of mass data is all but trivial. So that's the future and that's where all these data will come from. Um, this is taken from a recent review by Eric Topol, one of the um, gurus of individualized medicine or precision medicine, just recently published in Cell. Um, if you integrate all kinds of omics technologies, omics comes from the Greek, it means basically mass data. You analyze everything that you can with as much as uh, high penetration as possible. Um, and if you integrate it with social data, and biosensors and, and whatever you name it, you will come up with new topologies and maps, like Google Maps is actually a very good example how, how val what kind of value comes of creating this kind of topologies. What you can do with Google Maps, all kinds of secondary businesses, services to all kinds of businesses, that's something we are going to see once we have topological maps of health and disease as well. So, um, this is a fuzzy slide in a, in a way, but it's just an, a fingerprint of one person, Mike Snyder. That was one of the key milestone papers that I read re for uh, one and a half years ago. Um, he actually sequenced himself and followed himself for 18 months, took 20 different snapshots of blood samples, analyzed everything he could, uh, could, you, can, you can imagine, um, created 50 terabyte of data, each sample, just the material, to give you an idea what kind of costs arise when you do these kind of studies, each sample, just the reagents, costs about $2,000, not including the work, not including the time of the biostatisticians, and how much work went into this analysis, very complex, 18 months, a topological map of one individual, he had 40 co-authors. However, this is a milestone paper for several reasons. Um, first of all, he demonstrated how different we are from day, one day to the other, meaning our intra-individual variation is highly dependent on lifestyle, exercise, subclinical inflammation due to whatever virus or, or, um, or stressors. So if you, in the future, with highly sensitive methods, 
compare people like us in different stages. Do I have to rush? Five minutes, okay. So um, I'm sorry. That's basically what I was telling about. So all these data will eventually be integrated and we will analyze that and come to what we call personal molecular fingerprints. So how, what's the reality today? Rheumatoid arthritis is a major disease. 1% of the population has it. Um, it's, a, it's a tremendous cost burden. Um, how do we diagnose that? Basically with a scorecard. So if you have five joints over a certain extent of time, the patient doesn't really know how long he has the disease. So basically this is pathetic. And it's not surprising that most of the drugs that we give to the patients are just working for 20 to 30% of the patients very well. So the patient goes through an odyssey until he gets the right drug eventually. So what we don't have is basically diagnostic criteria. And what we need is precision medicine. Um, I like that slide a lot because it says, like, um, whenever scientists do something, they uncork new bottlenecks. That implies that we have basically our best ideas when we're drunk. And when we uncork the bottlenecks, we stumble over the next challenges, which are... I'm just rushing through those slides because you will hear about them in more detail in the following presentations. But the questions are, how is the safety, security of data secured? Who has access? Who owns the data? Who has the right to, uh, to commercialize that? That's all challenges that you have to confront when you try to develop a new business case. In this slide, just look at the, the red arrow. That's an accumulation of the costs that are being generated analyzing the mass data we generate. The costs for storage have dramatically decreased. The costs, for, however, for, for analytics are tremendously increasing, and we highly underestimate also the cost. Does anybody know why Facebook has its server farm in Finland? Who knows it? It's, the, it's cold. It's the cooling. The electricity that you would need for cooling these server farms would just kill the business model. Um, just one example what we did, number crunching, in very brief, it, this is, you should not read it, that's why it's not sharp. This is an, a small data set. It's in, a, in an Excel sheet and that's the visualization for groups of patients. It took the bioinformatics guys to analyze this set of data a day to develop a model. We used this technology from the CIA, others use NASA or DARPA. Ayasti, for example, is DARPA. We work with an Israeli guy from the CIA. Um, it takes five minutes to analyze this data and that's one of the ways how you can make business, because if you optimize these processes in the future, you can develop standardized analytics processes. And to make it even more complex, pattern discovery. I'm a strong believer of pattern discovery, which is not looking for set specific sets of biomarkers. So this was a recent Nature paper. Last week I found it. And it's the fight between the cuckoo and the other birds. The other birds try to adopt their patterns in a way so they can decipher with their inherited patterns what the cuckoo's egg is. So the cuckoo tries to adopt to, to these kinds of... But it's basically highly sophisticated patterns that are not accessible, and that's the major message, to our standard analytics tools. It's pattern discovery, it's artificial intelligence and machine learning, which is teaching us from nature that it's more dynamic, more specific, and that's the route we should go in the future for diagnosing diseases, rather than using stringent and uh, unflexible clusters. And things get even more complex. We as MDs have these kind of t-test models where we think things are, are very simple. This is the visualization of an immune response in a chaos pattern. Um, I have actually one slide, which is the following one. Uh, where we can't show you the video. It's a very trivial kid's toy. Three pendula in row. It's like three factors interacting. If you uh, irritate this pendulum, you would expect it might swing regularly. It doesn't. Three factors in a row, it's already a chaotic process. If it, over time, it looks fantastic. I can, unfortunately, I can't show you the video, which is in this slide. So it gives you an impression depending where you measure. Just Im imagine this is an in vitro experiment. And where do you end up when you measure? 
it's quite unsharp. So you need new mathematics methods to basically decipher this kind of complexity. But it's, it's doable. I, I have just friends that know what they do, and we talk to each other. And that's one of the major messages. Medicine will only evolve if we break up the silos, if we create some kind of domain competence for the bioinformatics guys, if the bioinformatics guys has to, has, have to learn about how we collect data, and I'd like to finish my presentation with one of my favorite problems identified in, in biomedical research, where we invest 100 uh, billion annually in research and the output for society is rather low. It's because we can't compare data, we can't reproduce data. It's like in The Economist, they had an article, science has a major problem. And we have the problem now that we adopt the data that are already stored somewhere at universities, those are the data that 80% are not reproducible. So how much sense does that, does that make? It's garbage in, garbage out. And this is a quote from the chief medical officer of IBM. It's not that I'm so arrogant to say that my colleagues create crap. It's the fact because we did not know better, but now we know better and we should do better. So. One of the things that we need to create value for, from all these big data are standard operation procedures. Those are the key value drivers. And the message that I would like to give to you is the pros should do it. We can't afford anymore to send out the students and postdocs to create some kind of SOPs, whatever they think SOPs are, uh, in, a, in a BMBF framework, by the way, the, the last call was like, create, let's create uh, SOPs in, in, in academia, um, which is very rewarding if you want to publish that in a high impact factor journal. So I was not sure what the strategy behind that is. But generally speaking, I think it's the small biotechs, large industry, they should come together and create the standards. And last slide, um, surfing invented in the US, big data, Anything you see, California is leading the way. They even let the mice surf. Um, but we in Europe, it, we have the advantage of the second mover. We can learn of all the crap they've been generating, all the mistakes they've been making, and we have the biggest waves here in Portugal. And we hold the world record in surfing, by the way. So thanks for your attention. If you have questions, um, contact me. I run two groups on LinkedIn. Um, precision medicine and big data. There are some people from f with the title Senior Vice President Pfizer, so you're most welcome to join in. And finally, uh, I'd like to thank all my colleagues and my team um, that made this vision possible.